Hello to all that uh, came in or coming in now. I'm uh, Geert, I will be your host for tonight. Together with uh, Baba Kanendu, we are the people uh, behind Walk, Listen, Create and Soundwalk September. And uh, first of all, I would like to wish you a very smooth and happy new year. And I hope it will be a less silent one as last year. Um, first of all, I would like to invite you and welcome you uh, to write your name and where you're from in the chat box. And if you wish so, your uh, wish, your sound wish for the sound walking community for 2021. Chat box you find uh, um, on the top of the screen. Um, next to a people icon, or next to an apps icon at the right side. So feel free to write your name, where you're from, and if you wish to add a wish to the sound working community for this new year, don't hesitate. So thank you all for these wishes and sharing from all over the world. Um, I will be your host tonight on this cafe. Um, it uh, is a cafe, so you're invited to participate with your contributions, your ideas, um, to add uh, your conversation to each other and to uh, Karina, who will introduce this cafe um, with some sharing about her work. Uh, I would like to present first Karina. She, uh, Karina Pesh is also known as La Pesh. She's a sound artist and a voice artist, a radio maker and a curator. And she has a very wide horizon of uh, sound works uh, in form and in content. She does radio documentary, radio fiction, improvised and scripted pieces, sound walks and audio walks, field recordings, compositions and soundscapes, sound installations and performances. Both solo as well, uh, very fascinating work uh, collectively. Karina has uh, learned from Pechinka, Antje Vovinkel, Hans Peter Kuhn, Christina Kubic, Chris Watson, and many others. And she's as well co curator of Geräuschkulisse in Leipzig, promoting the sound arts and fascination for the acoustic world with a strong sense for community in its a talk concept in its project. And I'm looking very forward to hear Karina talk more in this community that is Walkless and Create about her work. Karina, um, you're invited to present us your work. Mon welcome. Yeah, thank you, uh, Geert, Babak, and Andrew for inviting me. and. Uh, I have prepared a little presentation, uh, which I'm going to start now, if it works. So I have prepared some uh, sound examples, and I put them on a playlist on SoundCloud. Um, it's now in the chat, there's a link. But first, I want to go back to how it all started, um, give you a little bit of an impression where I'm coming from. So I started traveling very early with my mother. And then at some point, uh, I did a high school exchange year when I was 16 years old. And until then, I had no thought on what I wanted to do with my life uh, whatsoever. But in Bullhead City, which I only call Bullshit City in Arizona, I talked to my mother on the phone one day and she finally asked the question that every youngster does not want to hear what do you want to do with your life and I had no idea so she asked what are you good in and like doing and I said well writing and biology and at the end of that year she came to get me and before we went home we traveled a bit and we also went to Havasupai Falls which is a branch of Grand Canyon and it is a seven hour hike down the canyon and down there, these wonderful waterfalls were that you can see on the picture. Um, and a bit further, there's a campsite, and we met an old cowboy and the old Havasupai man there. 
And the cowboy asked the same question as my mother did before. Apparently a very important question to all adults when you're 16 or 17 years old. But this time I was prepared and I replied writing and biology. And he translated the conversation to his old Havasupai friend and he blessed me with a sacred song. So this was the beginning. Apparently they liked my answer and they found it fitting somehow for me. And it started with a question and a hike. And I found later that a question and a hike start quite a lot of things. Um, so when I returned from the USA, uh, I started writing short stories and poems because it was kind of tough returning after so long in these pretty strange lands in Arizona and after my father had passed during that time. So I needed an outlet, outlet somehow for those inner processes and to process everything that happened. And I also started writing for the local newspaper because I needed to earn money. And the second milestone happened during a cozy winter night. I was uh, studying social anthropology, political sciences and philosophy by then. And I spent the evening in front of my heating on the kitchen floor and I was wood carving the beauty that you can see on the, on the picture. And I was listening to the radio that was the only thing on my childhood ghetto blaster that was still working. So accidentally, I listened to my first radio feature, which in English is maybe better known under the word radio documentary. And I was simply blown away by the new dimensions that sounds can add to a story. And ever since I got deeper and deeper into sounds, I was always interested in somebody's work and I admired that person's work and I would then contact that person or book a workshop and try to learn what that person was doing and try to figure out what I found so inspiring about the approach to include in my own work. So these were the first steps more than 20 and 10 years ago. But what do I do today? Um, uh, radio features are kind of hard because they're all in German, but I found a little something. Um, it's called Uncle Otto, The Dead Live Longer. Longer. And it is about my grandfather's cousin, and he was a Catholic missionary on the island of Flores in Indonesia. And one of my childhood trips led to visit him when I was 14 years old. He was living in the middle of the mountains in the jungle, and he had built a church there for which he carried all the concrete, the stones, sand, bells from the coast, five foot to the mountain. Uh, sometimes little ponies, you can see in the picture, it's him with a little boy helping him. Um, I guess you could call him a freak, really. Um, and shortly after my first visit, he died. And I revisited to explore what he had left behind 20 years later. So the first work that I want to present to you tonight is a scene of me watching a video of a mess that he led with the people in the village. Um, so just from listening, if you have any <clears throat> questions or comments before I say anything about it, um, please feel free to ask or comment or talk about whatever comes to your mind. Could you mention again when this was recorded and uh, where exactly? Uh, that was recorded in 2016 on the island of Flores in Indonesia. It's a small village nowadays, which is called Lenkoela. It seemed to be coming from everywhere and was, uh, it seemed to be authentic ambient ambient noise with the music. It, 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 it was really good, I thought. Yeah, so this is not as I recorded it. It's a montage. So um, it's, yeah, it's, it's taken from the scene of watching the video and then also some more ambient field recordings like the, the rooster that you can hear and the bells and stuff like that. 
plus the old um, VHS video with the sound quality that it comes with. Yeah, really good. So uh, what I try to do is really come up with the typical things that I do from, from those work samples. The first is drifting, walking, exploring, and stumbling into the middle of everything. And with this project especially, I just went there. And one day before my flight, I sold the idea to my editor. I had no idea if the mission still existed. They had no idea it was coming. I did not even know how to find it, and I didn't speak the language. So I asked my way around um, in the bishop's town, Ruteng, which I kind of remembered from my first visit. And I disturbed the priests during their lunch, and they took care of me ever after. So what I like to do very often is to really use the snowball system, and I find it works very well, and it has me finding things that I would not find if I planned the whole thing. And it keeps me more open towards what's coming and to the experience as such. Then also paying attention to the sounds and what they tell. So here you have the sound of the voices and the environment, which tells so much. And the first thing that you realize is people are laughing about their former missionary. And it really shows the ambivalent relationship that the people there have to their old European missionaries. So they honor them for their hard work, but they also fear them, their hardness, their status, their power, and their discipline. And they make fun of them because they do not understand them. And they are so distant and strange to them. And this, I think, can really be understood without any language in the opening part of this radio feature. Then I also always try to derive my narration from experience. And I found this really nice quote by Paul Auster that language is not experience. It is a means of organizing experience. And I think the same applies to sounds if you compose, that it's always a means of organizing experience, at least for me. And then that I always try to use spoken word, not only as words, but also um, to transcend syntax and to reach an atmosphere or emotional quality. And to me, conversation is also experience because it's sharing and I never do catalog interviews. So it's always an open conversation. I'm prepared, of course, somehow, <laughs> like about the topic and stuff, but not with all the questions that I'm going to ask. It's always spontaneous. So here you see Otto's church in Lenkoela in 2018. You can see the windows are broken, so everything is a bit out of repair which tells you that money got really scarce after the European priests left. And um, you can also see the blue and white shrine uh, there in the background on the right hand side and with a dark red tile pointing to one of my favorite discoveries, discoveries during that journey. So within my bag, there was a video of the funeral and there was a funeral in the bishop's town and also in Lenkoela. And on the video, I could see that they put something in that shrine, but it was covered with a white cloth. So I didn't know what it was. And of course, I wanted to find out what it was. And uh, the thing is that the missionaries are not allowed to be buried in their parishes because Rome wants to prevent that they are worshipped or that they are considered holy. It's really a power struggle. So they put into that shrine what they had left of Otto, since they didn't get the body. And that was his hearing aid and his dentures. And this points towards another issue that the church has to face. And that is that people there have a very intense relationship to their ancestors and to the dead. And the church debates how to deal with it because they don't really know if it's good or bad. 
and um, the next track is and it's a part of a conversation that is in English that I had with a lay missionary from Texas and it's really about those borderlines. So I chose this one because it's very typical of my work that I always try to understand the emic view. So this is really something that comes from social anthropology. So how people themselves perceive what they're doing or how they see themselves. And then I create contact points and dialogue. And I think uh, in this conversation, this is what you, what you can hear there. And then I try to achieve intersubjectivity instead of objectivity, because especially with uh, social and um, cultural things, I do not believe that we are able to be objective. It, at least it's very, very hard and it's not possible if you just go there within one trip. Um, and then paying attention to critical details and wording as like, Worship and veneration are two different things and how they can also solve situations that were perceived in a very different way before. Um, where people draw personal and social boundaries and then noticing atmosphere and also finding how the topic resonates acoustically. So this was not a montage. This is a recording of the conversation as it was. And what I so love about it is that you, when we talk about the spirits and the evil spirits, you can hear the door moving in the wind and the squeaky sounds of the wood. And it, it just, it creates an atmosphere. And I'm not saying this from like spiritual intervention in, in the conversation, but if we want to tell a story with sounds, I think we have to be very focused on these acoustics and we can work with it. Can I say something no one else is talking about? I didn't hear this one, but I had an additional comment about the last one. Now, Robert Irwin, a uh, Californian artist, says that he sees his work as process, as an instrument to access process. And it's very similar to what you said, it's yours is a mechanism for hearing rather than the experience itself. And I, 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 I feel very good well, about that. During an experience. <laughs> you said, all I caught was I'm doing an experience. Did you hear what I, I don't know. I just said that I thought that uh, you're using, like Californian artists are working using art, visual art in this case, not as a, 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 a thing, as an artwork, but as a way of accessing process. So they're, they're, they're tools, they're instruments rather than they're, they're facilitators. And I think I heard you saying the similar thing about your work. It's there where they're, you use it to, for us to use to hear. I'm, not, I'm, I'm generalizing and I'm simplifying there, but I don't know if I could, maybe that's not, not very meaningful. Mm. Yeah, of course, I, in my work, I use them as tools or as a means of access, but also, I mean, experience as such is valuable. It's not that I only use it as a tool, it's more that during the experience, it's really the experience and I participate in the experience and I really delve into it. And then later I use it as a tool. So it's more like first comes the experience and then if I want to make a composition or a story out of it, then I use it. I need more distance and then I use it as a tool. And I always ask. That, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question, actually. Um, you were talking about being in the experience. Hey, Karina. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when you're talking about that, is the experience for you the conversation or because in that recording, the sounds are very atmospheric. And if you told me that you'd added them in hindsight, I would 100% have believed you because it felt very fitting in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And when you're in that conversation, are you 
including the surrounding sounds in that, or are you more focused on the conversation itself and the background sounds are a sort of thing that you examine in hindsight? Um, no, I would say the whole situation is the experience and one part of the experience is the conversation, if that makes sense. So um, I am always not only focused on the words a person is using, but also like facial expressions, body language. I look for contradictions between words and the sound of the voice, if it's really like a tough voice, but I don't know, but the, the eyes are always looking down, that could be a contradiction. And then this would give me an idea where to dig deeper maybe, or it could also be like interacting with the sounds of the environment, like in this part uh, of the conversation with the sounds. So I, it's really like in, in Tai Chi or something like that, where you stay like open-minded and you try to see like everything. Of course, you miss some things and sometimes during the experience, something seems so meaningful and then you listen to the recording and it's not in there. <laughs> that can also happen. That's why you need the distance afterwards to kind of like judge your experience really is in the recording or not. But I would always go with the experience and trust my subjective experience and the experience of the others and would maybe then try to recreate what is not in the recording. Nice, thanks, that was really interesting. Could I ask another question? I, I, seem to be, I, I, studied, with, uh, I, I studied with Lee Strasberg in Hollywood, I studied method acting and you learn the thoughts rather than the words people say. Is there a dimension of uh, uh, accounting, you said people's expressions and that their inner worlds or whatever that is, could be quite different to, to what the words are saying? Is that a similar sort of, you're, you're including the dimension of thinking a little bit into it, are you? Thinking, yes, possibly also thinking, maybe more focused on emotions because thinking is more conscious and then I try to bring observations that lead to something more emotional into the conversation and try to think together about that or like confront the people that I'm talking with. Okay, my observation is this and that. Um, how do you feel about it or, or think about it? Arthur, Thank yes. Yeah, something? thank you. Um, uh, maybe it's something you said, uh, I just I didn't get it, but um, are you, do you feel you're involved in a kind of research process uh, trying to, let's say, correlate uh, the ambient, the atmosphere, the sound atmosphere and, and emotions or how people uh, say things? Did you, did you notice? Uh, did you notice that, I, I don't know, like just, just before you were talking about uh, there is a door on the same time she's talking about the devil, but did you notice that the atmosphere changes definitely how people express things and notice how it changes uh, how people express uh, during the dialogue? Maybe. Let me know if I understood you right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mean the other way around, that the atmosphere of the place, for example, in sound, influences the person talking, right? Yeah. And how this person would talk about it. Uh, yes, I, in general, I do believe that is possible and that in, during conversations or interviews, of course, one can use it and create atmospheres or situations. Uh, that fit the context. But in this case, it was um, it was her living and workspace. So to her, these sounds probably are more daily than to me. Um, because there's always some sort of, or often there's rain, often there's wind. 
the doors are moving quite a lot. Um, and she didn't notice that it was happening exactly at this point of the conversation. I pointed it out to her and her reaction was, well, yeah, good that you pay attention to such things, which she meant, I believe, from a more spiritual perspective. But yeah, it's hard to tell if this influenced her answer, but in this case, I would say no. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, Artsu uh, has a question as well. Uh, please yeah, go on. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I wonder if I if I heard it right. You said your uncle, uh, like one of his remainings was put in the altar was a hearing aid. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So I wonder, like generally, was it also a little bit, maybe I'm jumping back to the first piece now, but like a bit of a tracing back of, I mean, even though it's basically a bit impossible, but like trying to travel back in time of what he might not have or what he might have heard, because with the edit, for example, or a recreation of, for example, uh, an inaudibility, you could also recreate what you would have projected on what he might have acoustically gone through or something like that. Is that in there? Mm, no, because I wasn't really concerned with him as a person as such but more with his impact on the people that are still alive and living there um, and how they remember him. And there, his disability to clearly listen or to hear, the hearing disability, um, it translated to him being very loud. And people there tend not to be very loud. So he was always kind of like yelling at them. Then he had this very harsh German accent <laughs> so this added to That's the not a good combo. <laughs> of fear. But yeah. And of but course, when he came there in the 60s, uh, they didn't know anything like that. They didn't know any fake teeth or hearing aids. They didn't even mm -hmm. have glasses or cars or whatever. Um, they were just living from the forest. Yeah. So all these things that he brought with him were completely new to him. And there's another little story that um, during my first visit, we were standing in a, a very traditional village and we ate some peanuts and he, we were standing there and everybody from the village came and then during the talk, he took out his dentures and he picked the peanuts and suddenly the whole village disappeared. They screamed and they cried and they disappeared because they were like, whoa, what is this? They've never seen anybody taking out the teeth. So yeah, this is related to the to the shrine. And the hearing aid is just pure coincidence. Sorry, I know just more, like it's coincidence or is it like more of a symbolic thing as well that they kept that and not the teeth, for example, or the teeth maybe belong to the body? Because he died uh, when he was asleep. And before he goes to sleep, he takes out the dentures and the hearing aid. So when they came to get the body, those things were left. Can I, can I say, I killed my mum in a car crash and I have also kept her hearing aid and dentures. I have them on the sideboard. That's the one memory by sheer coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> That's a uh, Elena, you had a question as well? No? Yeah, um, I want to go back to the um, thing you mentioned, Karina. Um, you said you are in the moment and you want to take in everything of this moment, like uh, visual and emotionally and interpersonality stuff. So um, I asked myself, how, how do you deal with moments where you realize that um, there, is some, there is something you experienced but it's not in the audio. And how how do I transport it? Yeah. Well, it depends what it is. If it's really, if I think it's very important to what I want to tell or to show in the composition and the piece, then I will 
keep my mind busy until I find an expression that expresses what I experience somehow to recreate or to um, well, I, I've never found nothing to express it. It takes sometimes it takes some time to find like a symbol um, that expresses the thing <laughs> that I want to be expressed. But it never happened that I didn't find a way to express. It. I'm not sure if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. There is no one answer, of course, but it's it's cool to know that you always find, found a way to translate it into uh, audio files, what you want to express. <laughs> Thanks. Maybe that is also uh, due to the, the approach, because since I don't have, I start, I have no idea what I'm getting into. So it's hard to be disappointed because everything is in the development and something will be in the end. And, at the start, I don't know what it's going to be, so I cannot be disappointed that I have not reached this goal to express this and that thing, if that makes sense. So now, um, it's a project that you were part of, Lena, both Lenas, actually. <laughs> it's uh, The project's name is Space We Space. And it's a live on air experiment that we did with Geräusch Kulisse Kollektiv and the sound artist JD Zazi, who's based in Berlin, during Synapse Festival 2018. And my two colleagues, Lena Löhr and Martina Weber, led two groups of sound walkers, and I was a microphone on two legs. And I streamed the sounds live to the studio, where JD Zazi was live mixing, modulating, and composing. And she had never experienced the place before. And she only got to know it via the sounds that I sent her. I used the contact microphone and the binaural microphones. And uh, we are going to listen to the reflection round that we had at the end of the sound walk, where the participants of the sound walk expressed their experience. Uh, yeah, so I chose this one uh, because it's this closely listening is really typical, not only during sound forks, as you could see on the pictures that we asked people to press their ears on surfaces, but also during conversations, like really closely listening and listening also in a more social and political sense, like listening to all the diversity of people. And uh, then I always try to pay attention to the rhythms, repetition, and patterns that are found in environmental sounds. And also that we like to explore urban space consciously as a means of escaping daily perception and to turn off all the filters that we carry around with us and to escape into the extraordinary. And then we also try to link our findings to environmental and community projects, as we, for example, did with another sound walk in the east of Leipzig. It's called East Park Fiction. And there people want to create um, um, like a community garden, community park, uh, like development from, from like grassroots development of the city. And so we did the sound walk there to give some input and ideas from their own experiences, what they actually want from the space and how to come up with new ideas, also sound-wise for the place. Um, so at this point, I would be really curious if, I mean, I know some of you um, took part in one of our sound walks before or listened to the composition, um, but, or the others, do you have own experiences with sound walks, leading sound walks, participating 
in sound works, what you like about them. Um, yeah. I think, um, oh, sorry, I should have probably yeah, raised my hand, but um, I think, uh, especially with your sound work, uh, Karina, um, uh, Space We Space, I really liked um, that it was very industrial and it was focusing on. Um, there's obviously the uh, nature present in the recordings, but it wasn't the, the main focus. And I liked how instrumental uh, the simple sounds became, like we could hear at the end of this uh, sample that you showed us. Um, it, it sounds very um, organic, almost um, like we're listening to some instruments and the obviously using the acoustics to, to um, to make that more present is really interesting because I think with sound works, sometimes the focus is mainly on the nature when it's uh, great to um, take out of the environment as it is. Um, and that's very creative, obviously. Well, to add something to that, that, when I do sound works, actually, I, my sound works are all very silent, which is, of course, the condition as well to listen is um, that is very horizontal it's not led by somebody it's always somebody taking uh, the lead and going intuitively to a next uh, next place uh, leading to be in a state of being lost all the time which is in a, for, um, a form of complete immersion and um, connection with where you are because you're not trying to control uh, so um, i think uh, Together with walking um, in general, uh, that sound walking is one of the last and um, ultimate uh, actions that is not consuming. It's not uh, even doing something. It's a form of being, which is, of course, my very personal experience. Um, but what this as well, what makes sound walking so attractive for me, the freedom of it. Yeah, I totally agree. Like it really puts you into a different state. However, our approach is really leading it. It's it's actually composed in a way. Um, I don't know, Lena. You can also answer this question. Maybe why do we lead? <laughs> um, probably because we know the the space better, and we really go there. Uh, before we do a sound walk and we explore and we find those spots that are really interesting and um, where would because we this one I said already that we play a lot with surfaces and close listening but we also interact with the environment like with clapping or using the voice and to give people the impression what resonance actually can tell you about a place. For example, that when you walk around a corner, that it sounds different because you had, before you had the reflections from the wall. Um, yeah, what would you say? Why do you lead a sound walk? <laughs> Probably due to composition, I would say. Yeah, and, and also I think, um, I can't hear myself. Um, also because yeah like giving people a new experience in a space they maybe even know very well like the one participant in the example we heard but who don't have this kind of curiosity or haven't had before to discover like the acoustics of a place in this hidden sounds in the metal tubes and paying attention to these slight changes so that's what people often say after sound walk, let sound walk, that they then go off doing sound walks by themselves and have like a different focus. And I think it's this my interest to change people's focus for for this one hour. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I would have said also as a participant um, who, um, yeah, who after I was going with you, led by you, um, was able to create my own getting lost and doing a sound work on my own or with other people, but um, to first be, I don't know, 
uh, shown how to turn off my visual senses uh, to focus on my ears uh, was the first step to getting into it and to learn to getting lost. So it's a good, I think um, being led is a good uh, first sound work maybe. So Geert, if you if you do sound box that are not led, do you explore the space before to give some input, or do you just explore the space for the first time with the group? Yeah, no, uh, I'll uh, I'll answer you on that. Uh, just I was thinking about finding you midway uh, by saying that um, I love to get I love to get lost in the right direction. And uh, so it's not because you're leading, you cannot be in a state of, of being lost. And uh, actually what in the box I do, uh, we completely get lost. Although that's an, you never get lost uh, because your body always remembers. Your body always remembers where you come from. And eventually you always return when you are, uh, when you are uh, uh, departing, uh, departing from. There were, but there were situations in which we as, where we as a group uh, were completely uh, in, a, in an area in an environment where we didn't know, had a clue anymore how we got there. And, uh, but eventually the coming back is always an, um, a very, even if you don't know uh, how to get back, it's always an, an, a recognizing. Uh, because you let go of the understanding, uh, the, you use the whole body, you listen with the whole body, you, you um, perceive with the whole body, and, uh, and by that trust you find your way back. So I, no, I do not uh, uh, explore the area on the forehand. Mm -hmm. um, Can I jump in? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, so I yeah like yet I I have run sound walks before, and it's usually not prescribed and very exploratory. Um, and I, my sort of reason for loving sound walks and uh, finding them very valuable is it's like you were saying before about the the value of the experience. Um, as to post just this finished artwork um, and sort of looking as art as experience as opposed to product orientated. Um, there's there's real value in, and what I try to do with my sound works is I, I want to bring community into dialogue or relationship with their surrounding environment. Um, and so yeah, I did very, very much like yet. I, <laughs> and perhaps because of lack of time and um, energy, I don't go out beforehand <laughs> and it's more about just getting people out there um, and and listening. But it is usually with people who are already interested in sound and stuff. Um, but yeah, I think it's, and also the whole entering that other state of being, for me, it's it's a form of meditation or, and, and so good for well your personal well-being, but then it's bringing people together and collective well-being and then considering the well like Murray Shea for the tuning of the world, this this idea that we need to consider our acoustic environment and how healthy it is for us. Um, yeah, I love sound works. <laughs> Andrew, I see that you have some interesting remarks. Would you like to add something to this uh, topic? Um, no, it's really interesting what you were saying. And I like the kind of, um, Sort of kind of anthropological kind of approach you've been taking, um, if that's the right way of describing it. Um, you know, I, I've done loads and loads of lead sound walks or listening walks, both when when people are listening to things on headphones and when people are just listening to the the kinetic noises we can make as they walk along. Um, and uh, I actually find it quite difficult to reproduce the, the live work into a recorded piece and make it appear like a recorded piece, like a live work. 
that makes sense. Um, so I, I thought what you'd done was really Im impressive because um, I, I was sort of transported to a different place very effectively. Um, so no, I, li I like that a lot. What I was just sort of, I, I sort of posited a question about the duration of pieces because obviously the pieces you've let, let us play are just, I mean, are they whole pieces or are they tracks to a to an album or are they, I wasn't quite sure whether, you know, what's the duration of a piece and what, when when is the duration of a sound walk? Uh, when does that become kind of slow radio and not, and not a sound art composition? I don't know, maybe I'm just waffling away. <laughs> Sorry. Not terribly coherent. Well, I think it's not about duration to distinguish a sound work from a slow radio or any kind of radio piece or a composition. But the sound work always is on location, walking and listening to the environment. Now, what I played back to you is not the sound work, but it was an artwork, a live on air radio experiment that was then transformed into a shorter radio version um, that was created along the way at the same time with the sound walk, but it's a totally different experience. And we did not try to recreate the sound walk or just make a recording of the sound walk because we also had the sound artist sitting in the studio and she played with the material and she put in some sounds, for example, you can hear I think it's an ambulance, but from another country, which you can hear because the sound is a different one. So suddenly through the city of Leipzig goes this, maybe Italian because originally she's from Italy, drives through this <laughs> Italian ambulance or from wherever she got the recording. She also had quite a lot of train recordings from all over the world that she mixed with the train recordings that I sent her. Um, she would put in nightingales, although we were listening to sparrows. <laughs> so she created a fiction really from the more documentary sounds that I was sending her in real time. Um, so this was another kind of artwork that was cre created at this one occasion. But the sound work we do a couple of times. Um, the next project that I would like to present to you, uh, there's only one more little soundbite coming then after this project. Um, it's a COVID-19 victim somehow, but it survived by drastic changes. So the original idea was a radio composition, a radio play, where I would follow people on the street and I wanted to observe them and follow them for a longer time. And I would use a voice info technique called automatic speaking. It's, it was invented by Antje Vorwinkel. And basically it's just, it's like écriture automatique where you just speak your mind, anything that comes to your mind in the present moment, you just voice right away. Right, right away. And from my observations, I wanted to derive a story about the person that I followed. And then, in the second step, confront the person that I followed with my story that I created about them and ask for the truth. Uh, well, this couldn't be done because I was recognized too fast because nobody was out on the street anymore and people were trying always to get to the distance. Uh, with other people, so I did two transformations of the original of the original idea. Um, uh, one of which I'm going to present now, and this one was a live performance that I created during a masterclass with Alessandro Bossetti in um, Al with Fonur Gianova, and it was divided into two parts. So I had four performers in a park and they were connected to my mixer via smartphone, um, mobile phones. And two of those performers were following strangers and two were following within the group, but nobody knew who was who. And we, that was the first part. 
that we're going to listen to now. Yes, yeah, so this first part um, is really about getting the performers into projecting and uh, following and creating stories. And the second part is about reflecting the experience. And um, so for the second part, the performers return to the venue after a timer interrupts their explorations in the park, and then they go back and they gather around a microphone in front of the audience and they reflect upon the experience together. So maybe some of you know those books where you have each page is cut into three parts and then there is a sentence written across the pages or like across all three pieces of one page and each piece can be turned separately and the sentence keeps changing, but it still makes sense. So this is what I wanted the performers to try, but while speaking together. So somebody would start with the first part of the sentence and then another one would take over and continue the sentence. A third person would take over and on it goes. Uh, and the, the aim was to recreate the experience together with all its contradictions and in all its diversity. So if you return to the playlist and listen to the fifth track, follow me number two. This one, um, the whole thing I chose to because it's typical that I like to work with voice improvisation that is really inspired by Dada and sound poetry and automatic speaking. Uh, I love experimental explorations of topics. And I really believe that there is no such thing as a mistake. So that is also why, especially the first part that we listened to, it is there, I didn't do a lot of post-production uh, it is really this kind of crappy audio quality, which I also kind of like about. And I try to more like play with the mistakes instead of trying to correct them. And then the focus on social and psychological phenomena and my interest in perception and how we perceive the world and in collective processes, which was especially in the second part of it. Also, I know Azu participated in one automatic speaking uh, experiment that we did here with Walk, Listen, Create with, with the, what's the name of the festival again? Walk Lab 2 PT? <laughs> no, it, it was uh, Drifting Bodies Through in Spaces and it was a uh, conference and encounters in Guimarães in Portugal. Uh, but uh, because of the pandemic, we made it global inviting uh, people around the world to walk and drift uh, in their places and you invited people to um, walk with you uh, while talking. Walking and speaking. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I was exploring Brussels for us. <laughs> so here's another automatic speaking project that I worked on. Can I show you this? This is my mum, her glasses and, and her false teeth. And it's a little bird that I used to squeeze. And she was 93 and it used to make her happy. So they're all the things I had when she, after she died. So I just wanted to show you that. <laughs> uh, While well, we are... Uh on the very intimate tour actually i was quite surprised because my very first girlfriend uh, was from Arlen in, uh, in uh, and uh, i never thought about this place again uh, from my, uh, and thanks to you i, I traveled back to Arlen um, and drifted with you again <laughs> in time not only in space but, so 
Beautiful work. Mm -hmm. I think I can Very nice, actually. But add, like, I was also like thinking, like the sand walk we did was so much more like placed in this raw reality of being outside and in the moment with, I mean, we did it live with the headphones. So it was like full with scratching, microphones on clothes, you know, footsteps, everything like very, let's say dirty, I guess. And the two pieces we listened to, um, they seem much, much more, uh, in a way, very beautiful, but decorated. Like I feel a bit like outside, um, like in the first one, I was really kind of like the scratching of the LP sound was very, very soothing, was very like, huh, you know, you want to listen to that. And then in the second piece, kind of like this singing bowly type of background noise. So, I mean, like in a way, the automatic speaking happens more or the, the walking, let's say with the automatic speaking happens more in a, yeah, in like an eerie type of imaginary space there for me, at least, but which is kind of paired with, especially in the second part, with this kind of very stagnate, like, yeah, this small staccatos in the way that they're speaking. Of course, that's basically like turning around the leaf of the, of the words, so to speak, or sounds a bit more like this, we complete each other's sentences, but we don't, you know, it's like this, Kind of interesting, uh, yeah, sort of, sort of surrealistic level, I guess. I don't know. That that was my experience. I wonder what, uh, yeah, was that like something that you would be in, like that you intended? Because it's very opposing to what we did, for example, for the festival, right? Yeah, um, I think this one because this was live mixed, so each performer with the phone was on one channel so i could i could choose which one i would zoom into and when to leave um which was kind of exciting because i never knew what i was getting um and also it was really fascinating because sometimes just by coincidence i would fade out in one sentence and fade in in another sentence and they would just magically match so somebody started ended with um i am going and another buddy would say to the park and that was just so magical in this live moment that although it was not planned sometimes it just fitted other times it didn't and yeah that was really fun to play with did not really answer your question or was not really about No, no, that. I think maybe that there is something about that. I remember talking about it also in the after talk or that there was this thing of like, maybe you could orchestrate it by fading them in and out and, you know, like sort of, yeah, yeah, mixing it basically. Uh, but this but one actually there... from before. <laughs> ah, really? Okay, yeah. so, ah, okay, so you had that already. Yeah, but maybe that could be one thing to just try out with like a bigger orchestra, right? So like, but I don't know, I was just like, all of a sudden, when you were saying that, I was just thinking of like a, uh, sort of like a spheric dome that just like froze over to wherever they are and wherever you are. I mean, not to sound too like uh, crazy, but like maybe there is something about trans, or like pan walls listening type of thing. Of course, I mean, that's it's pure coincidence, but it's kind of fun to think about like whether you've tuned in to whatever frequency they're emitting. A bit like the whales over the ocean, you know, like from very far away, you could hear them or something like that. Or, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it could be fun but, to uh, maybe just that because maybe not everybody knows what the distance distant walk was like um, there was we had performers all over the world uh, connected via I think zoom it was and then uh, everybody was walking wherever they were so there was somebody in London there was you in Brussels I was in Leipzig there were others I think there was one in Egypt and wherever they were <laughs> and we were all connected and then I would call names and that person had to start speaking right away in this automatic speaking technique 
and until I called another name and then the other person would talk about their experience and where they were walking. So this was more like a whole part of one space and then jump to the next space while here it was jumping back and forth. Uh, Karina, we are going slowly to, um, uh, yeah, we are past 9.30. Um, if you want to add something more, um, did you have one more piece that we could listen to? Or did, yes, please. <laughs> yes, it would be great. Uh, it would be wonderful <laughs> to listen to. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Also one um, that whoop, brings us back to the beginning of the talk. So, in the beginning, I said um, I was going to write and do biology. So, I do actually also record wildlife. So, the blessings of the old have a supply, man, were not in vain. And as my last sound example, um, please enjoy a trip to the flamingos in Kamark. Uh, it's number six flamingos. And if you like to try some following yourself, by the end of this month, you will find a score um, where I make you follow somebody. <laughs> On this side, I put a link to the chat. It should be published maybe next weekend or after. I'm not sure because I'm not publishing it. And if you're interested in the album that is shortlisted for the Soundwalk September 2020 award, this link will lead you there. Thank you, Karina, for letting us travel in with our ears. Um, um, if would, somebody would still have a um, uh, question, remark, feedback, uh, an idea that he would like to share, um, please, um, please do. How can we move outside these constructs? I mean, there's everything else as a part of the ones that you presented. I'm thinking of everything else. Is that is there a way of including that as well? What we've done is broken down to my sort of a world I've been living in for the last 55 years, and it's opened that up. But then anything can go, not right necessarily what you're saying in words, but everything. The sound of every, is that is there a way to bring that in too? I'm not sure if I understood to bring what in? Well, everything. Things I'm thinking, things the gentleman on the screen thinking, just everything. Not just sounds, but sound. How can I put it? It's like everything. You're saying about sort of automatic talking. What about mm -hmm. automatic thinking? And automatic thinking goes into every thought, not just the word construction, but uh, it opens up enormous realms. Yeah, I mean, nobody stops you from automatic thinking. I think we all do in a way, constantly, or at least I'm not that good in stopping my thinking. I need to meditate quite a long time to stop my thinking. But connecting via thought is more difficult, I guess. Yeah, but I think what you your, what you presented has opened this world to me just in this hour and a half or whatever, is open this possibility. It's not necessarily the sound, literal sound I heard, but it's what it's opened in my mind. Mm. That's good. I'm glad mm. to hear. That's mm. what it should be doing. <laughs> Karina, can you maybe say a little bit about uh, the piece indeed that was nominated uh, or shortlisted for Soundwalk September, The Ears May Travel? Just maybe a few minutes to uh, talk about what it is and um, what it uh, allows the listener to hear. Yeah, sure. Um, well, basically, it, it's what I, it's a project that I started during the first lockdown this spring. And um, 
since nothing was possible anymore, I had the time to go through my archives with all the field recordings, a lot of binary recordings, and also to do new ones to um, kind of like document the new sound environment. And I just decided to create an album from it because I heard a lot of people I mean, during the first lockdown in Germany, we were quite lucky. We were still allowed to go outside and walking and do most of the things, but others were really confined to their homes. So there was suddenly this huge increase and an in interest of listening to nature when you cannot go there anymore. So to bring nature to your home. And um, this is more or less what I picked up on. And then also a political dimension because um, it was kind of strange how traveling was restricted in some ways and in other ways it was enforced. For example, in Germany we had um, like, uh, what's it called? Um, those people who harvest asparagus, 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 um, they usually come from Eastern European countries and all borders were closed, but magically those workers were, were flown in and they were separated in these like, more or less detention centers and where, so there was still space for exploitation basically, but people were not allowed to move freely anymore. So this was also what I was concerned with and um, I just wanted everybody to be able to travel and if not in the real world, then at least in Im imagination and to open this mind space so that people consider the possibility and also who is able to travel and who is not able to travel and to bring this to consciousness. Thank you, Karina. Um, it uh, was a journey. Um, there's still space for some feedback, some questions, or to tell something about your experience or your practice uh, connecting with this conversation, if you would feel like. Um... Well, ah! I did a. Um, that is your experience? Yeah, that's my. I, that's my. My practice has been making as much noise as would come out of my mouth. And moving my body as violently as it was ago. This is since the 60s onwards, and nobody could make hand, head or tail of it, and they still can't. But uh, that's where I'm coming from. <laughs> Just um, I, I'm totally anarchic. I don't have any polarities or anything. I don't. I don't respect any, as far as I know, any confines in that sense. And uh, no, it's very. It's comforting to hear others are working, and you know, contemporary people are working in that area too, because it's, 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 it's good. Thank you. Can I ask about more ethnographic work when you've been recording, and even just like the your the um, follow me stuff, when you are recording other people and using their their voices and and sounds within your work, what sort of um, permission and 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 how do you go about? asking for permission to use that within your work is, yeah. <laughs> well, that really depends what kind of work it is. If it's more documentary work, um, of course I have permission if I'm recording somebody. I mean, also I give them the, the microphone. I mean, especially if you go places where people might not necessarily know what a recording device is and what it does. and what I do with it, I always make sure to explain to them um, well, that it's going to end up on the radio. So most people nowadays, at least I haven't come across anybody who doesn't know what a radio is. Uh, so I do explain to people what I'm doing with it. I also talk to them about what I'm interested in and what I want to create from it, which is not always defined once I'm there. So I always rely on the trust of the people. 
um, that they just trust in me doing something with it, or sometimes they also don't care, I think. Uh, if it's more like field recordings and there's people voices, like people passing by or, um, I don't know, children playing on a playground, in these situations, I have to admit, I do not ask permission. And I just, I mean, it's like taking a picture of a mass of people, like during a demonstration to me, because there it's not about the individual voice, but more about the whole, well, not picture, but <laughs> atmosphere. Um, yeah, in these cases, I don't ask permission. But if it's really zoomed, zoomed in on a on an individual, of course. Thank you very much. It's just, I don't know, working in academic environments, <laughs> you have to do lots of ethics approvals and things. Yeah. If, Can I, if, one more if, thing. If, yeah. if I'm working for like a radio station or something like that, um, then I also let them give me their permission on tape. So on the recording, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Do you grant me permission to record? Yes, I do. Okay. Then I have it. Just one quickly, can I ask if you've been able to play the the Uncle Otto back to the people in Indonesia who you worked with, or is that no, you haven't? Okay. Um, it's all it's very difficult because um, it, except those parts that you heard, it's all in German, mm -hmm. and the conversation that was in English, which people there don't understand. Um, is not in the piece like this, just little parts and then German translation. Not to insult uh, Robert, but let's try to finish with a beautiful silence. And uh, uh, <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Karina, for sharing this. Um, um, the video of this uh, conversation will be available uh, for you if you want to enjoy uh, the conversation once again. Thank you so much uh, for being there, for sharing your thoughts, your ideas, your feedback. Enjoy your evening.